you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, so we are going to, you know, talk about Red Hat and Microsoft and Linux and testing. Uh, I came from the open source world and I've been uh, doing software testing at Red Hat for a, a very, very long time, as you can see. Uh, and I love to speak at conferences. I don't have any other pictures except uh, somewhere I've been at the conference. Uh, and uh, I am also the project lead of uh, Kiwi TCMS, which is an open source test case management system. Uh, and it's an interesting project with an interesting history, so please check it out, give me feedbacks, report bugs uh, if you're, you know, uh, need something like that. Uh, we are happy to fix bugs for you. Um, and with that said, I'm done with the shameless self-promotion and uh, let's talk about pairwise testing. Uh, so, uh, anyone familiar with uh, what pairwise is? Okay, one, two, three, couple guys, okay, cool. Uh, for the rest who are not familiar, uh, I have an example to uh, demonstrate. Imagine that uh, our job is to test this car and you know because we are diligent testers and we look carefully to what's given to us we see that we, we've got a few uh, options for batteries and uh, a few options for wheels and also we have performance mode and you know dual engine single engine and stuff like that so we have options which may that these are input parameters which may affect the performance of the car so therefore we have to test them and here is a list uh, to make things easier to comprehend and just for the sake of the example, I have added uh, some more options uh, so we can have more combinations uh, in the example afterwards. Uh, and, and these ones, I've just uh, made them independent of one another to make things simple, for example. Uh, if you want to do exhaustive testing of uh, all these parameters and their in possible values, we have 32 different combinations between the two, uh, which means uh, 32 different uh, test environments that we need to uh, work with or in reality if we're testing the car that means 32 different cars for test so that's quite a lot uh, and uh, pairwise is all about reducing that number so pairwise uh, says we should not test all possible combinations uh, between all parameters that we have uh, and uh, on a website uh, they claim that uh, in complex software systems you don't need to be able to control uh, all the input parameters at once to trigger some defects. You need to be able to control at most two of them to trigger pretty much all of the defects. Not all of them, but a good amount of them. So if you can trigger defects by controlling only two parameters, that means you can design your tests to take into account combinations of two and not combinations between more parameters. Uh, so pairwise, is, uh, they, it's also called all pairs, uh, all pairs of two uh, testing. Uh, and in this matrix, in the example, if you look at it, uh, it contains all pedals, so um, 60 kilowatt battery with single engine, uh, and then, you know, 60 kilowatt battery with dual engine, and then again, 60 kV with 21 inch wheels and with 19 inch wheels and so on. So it contains all possible pairs of two, but doesn't contain all possible combinations. Uh, and the maximum size of this uh, kind of matrices uh, is determined by the two parameters with the largest set of possible values. So in this case, we have battery with four values and engine with two values. So, yes? So I said it's all combinations of two. What about single, no, and uh, for example, no line Which one? Single engine and no performance mode. Uh, okay, single and, okay. Yeah, bad example. <laughs> so that should be, <laughs> so, so, so this cool. should be here. <laughs> Yeah, because I, I've create, created this by hand to be beautiful. Yeah, good catch. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, that's the eight. In, in this example, eight is the largest possible value of this matrix. So you take the, the two parameters with uh, the most values and multiply them. That's the largest size. And obviously, eight is much smaller than 32. Uh, uh, there is a community website called pairwise.org. Uh, Microsoft is sponsoring it. Uh, and they seem to be pretty much the, the only one entity that is promoting this kind of testing, at least to my knowledge. Um, on this website, uh, there, there is a list of a lot of research papers. Um, there's also a list of uh, many different tooling for different programming languages uh, available from the website. There is also a pairwise tool uh, from Microsoft available on their GitHub account. Uh, and they claim that pairwise testing is effective at uh, finding defects and it's uh, an effective uh, test strategy 
and using these tools that are available and knowing how, how Pairwise works, uh, you can actually use it to uh, generate uh, your test cases with particular parameters automatically. So you have some tools that, tool that tells you what to do uh, when you perform testing. And this is what I, what I did. Uh, I made an experiment uh, which involves uh, uh, installation testing of Enterprise Linux uh, version 6.9 in particular, uh, where I applied uh, these techniques to the entire testing campaign of the product and across all product variants to see what will happen. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, the experiment. Uh, installation testing very quickly. Uh, this is what my team does and uh, what you know uh, I'm going to talk about. Uh, we have this uh, program called Anaconda. This is the installation program for Fedora, Enterprise Linux, CentOS, uh, these types of distributions. Uh, and our job is to test that piece of software to make sure Linux can be installed on your computer. And when you click the finish button, the restart bot button uh, in the installation screen, you can actually uh, reboot into a possibly working system. You know, at, at least you can be able to log into a command line and fix it from there. Uh, and we, you know, it's uh, mostly written in Python with the graphical user interface. It has uh, also text mode user interface, command line, fully automated interface. Uh, we have integrations with uh, different tooling from Linux. So, for example, here it says file system type, uh, and it's drop down. Uh, you have uh, all possible file system types that are supported in the Linux distribution. Uh, and to be able to uh, perform partitioning uh, with these file system types, we actually, the installation program, integrates with uh, the command line tools for the, that particular file system. Um, so we have one screen, but it does behind the scenes, it does different things. Uh, we also have, for example, uh, networking to download from the network uh, inside of the installation program, and that's a network manager. We don't manage networking by ourselves. We just integrate with network manager. Uh, and all, all these integrations, uh, they can be uh, a source of uh, problems. Uh, and this is usually how our test cases are, are designed. We, we try to design around these integrations and what could possibly go wrong. Uh, from the point of view of testing, we have nine different product variants. So we have stuff like uh, client and server and workstation. Uh, and we have uh, different uh, CPU architectures, diff different hardware that uh, uh, these variants run on. So we have Intel 32 and 64 bit. And we also have um, IBM Power and IBM Mainframe uh, that we support on the server variant. Uh, and uh, in Fedora or you know, new versions, we have other hardware platforms like ARM64, for, for example. Uh, so this number can grow. Uh, you now it can become very large. The traditional way of how the team is handling that is for each product variant, which is uh, some content set and on a CPU architecture, we have one person that is dedicated to only that variant. And they are responsible for testing uh, everything on that variant. Uh, we call them uh, variant uh, owners or architecture owners. Uh, the interesting thing about all these variants is actually that they are mostly the same thing. Uh, the software is the same uh, when, it's, when the software is put into the uh, installation media. Uh, our build servers, they have no idea uh, for what kind of variant they are building. Uh, and uh, the software itself uh, very rarely does any checks on to, to see on what platform it's running. Uh, pretty much all the times we uh, only check what is the uh, underlying CPU architecture if we need to do something uh, which is specific to that architecture. So for the majority of cases, uh, uh, all of these variants work pretty much in the same way. Um, and when I told you I, I do testing for a long time, I, I've been testing installation for the last 11 years, uh, and I very rarely have seen bugs uh, about something that works uh, on one variant and the same thing doesn't work uh, on another variant. So that's why I, I think it's mostly safe to consider these product variants to be independent and to be the same thing. Um, and you'll see why we'll later. Uh, the test suite that uh, we primarily use uh, for installation testing is split into three groups, um, co so-called tier one, two, and three. Tier one is a very, very small uh, test suite. Uh, it's uh, fully automated. It runs 
against every single build, uh, against every single product variant, uh, and uh, it's not subject to my experiment. We don't want to touch it. Uh, tier 2 and 3 uh, is the subject of the experiment. It's a much, much larger test suite. The number of test cases in, in the tier 2 and 3 group is almost 20 times as much compared to uh, tier 1. Uh, traditionally, we try to execute uh, tier 2 and 3 at least once per week. We try to complete all the testing. Um, our testing campaign is usually several months long, and during that time, we average around 6,000 uh, test case executions, which means 6,000 times reboot into installation media. Take your time, about 20 to 30 minutes, to complete the installation and then reboot into the system to see if, if it's working as expected. So that takes quite a lot of time. Um, you know, obviously that doesn't scale much. Uh, and let's see what we can do about it. Uh, so I've studied my uh, test suite and created a very, very simple experiment. Uh, the first thing is that we actually do some test cases which are platform dependent. Uh, not many of them, uh, mostly on uh, IBM Power and IBM mainframe platforms. So there isn't much we can do about them. You know, it, it's not like we cannot uh, execute these cases. We have to execute them. Uh, so we just take them and transfer them to uh, uh, my experiment test plan and, and go on from there. And then we have a larger group of tests uh, which have parameters. So stuff like uh, we, ha we have a test case called storage slash iSCSI, and that means uh, perform installation, uh, attach uh, a disk over the network, and place th the root file system on that disk. And for that test case, um, we have uh, authentication type, uh, and we're interested in only these three. Uh, and we also have a networking subsystem that manages the iSCSI connections in, on Linux. And on uh, RHEL version 6, uh, we have two uh, networking subsystems which need to be able to work pretty much in the same way. Uh, so for testing, that means uh, six uh, combinations for only one test case. Uh, now I said the pairwise uh, uh, is uh, something to do with parameters. And if we try to apply pairwise here, uh, we don't get any difference beca because we have only two parameters. And uh, looking at the existing test suite, uh, Almost uh, all the tests ha have only two parameters. Uh, very rarely we have three, four, or five parameters uh, in a test case that we want to test. Uh, but across all variants, you know, I have to execute uh, these six, nine times, so it equals 54. Uh, and I can consider the variant to be a parameter to testing. And this is what I did. I've applied pairwise across all parameters, including the product variant S parameter. Uh, and now that we have three parameters, you know, we can do the calculation. We see that we get 50% reduction immediately, which is, yay, cool. Uh, and the last group of tests uh, that we have in our test suite uh, are such that they do not have any visible parameters uh, that we care about. Uh, and for example, we have this called partitioning slash swap on LVM, uh, which means uh, install Linux, uh, you know, do the partitioning, uh, don't care what you do as long as you place the swap partition on LVM, on logical volume, and make sure that it's working. Um, and the only thing I can, I can do about it, uh, instead of executing it nine different times for every single variant, uh, I can randomize and say I want to execute only one time, and for every different build, I want to randomize on what product variant I'm executing that per cases from this, from this group. So this is the third part of my experiment. Uh, very simple algorithm, uh, and I was very quick actually to, uh, to create my experiment, uh, but I needed some acceptance criteria, and I know I should have done this beforehand, but I actually defined them uh, after I, I knew how to execute the experiment. Uh, first, I obviously want to have less test cases, case executions in total, so anything under 6,000 will be fine, and you can actually calculate on paper how much. Uh, savings you're going to get even before uh, starting testing. Uh, the second is more hard to measure. I don't want to be missing existing bugs. So I want to test less, but at the same time, I don't want to say to my product manager, yeah, everything is green uh, because I, you know, I, but I didn't test, so there were some bugs, but I have no idea what these bugs are. 
Uh, and for that reason, I compared the bugs that I found during my experiment with uh, the bugs that the rest of the team has found. Uh, and the last one is even more trickier to measure, don't increase product risk. And for the sake of the experiment, we measure product risk as the number of bugs which are reported as critical and that I was not able to find for some reason. And I want to know why I was not able to do this because I want to make pairwise the main testing strategy. Uh, so uh, the results, before we continue, uh, if anyone isn't clear about this, I made my experiment in parallel with the rest of the team. So anything that I was doing uh, had no impact on the release schedule of the product and on the work of the rest of the team. So everybody else was working like they were used to uh, before that and I was doing everything alone just as an experiment in parallel. Uh, this is pre pretty much my most. Do you want questions during your presentation or at the end? Uh, if you're quick, you can, we can do it now. You didn't mention any reference to historical bugs as hints or axes or variants at, or, uh, for para as parameters or indications of a multi-parameter bug that you might have missed. Did mm. you look at historical bugs? No, pretty much no. Okay. Uh, so this is my most impressive metric. I was able to uh, achieve 65% less test case execution. So I didn't execute 6,000. I executed about 2,000, which is cool. Uh, I was able to achieve 76% execution completion rate. Uh, so that means from um, all these 2,000, I was able to complete 76% of them. And the historical average for the Rail 6 release of the team is 85%. Uh, so I remind you, I was working alone. If we work as a team uh, using Pairwise, I'm, I'm sure we can beat 85%. We can probably do even 100% if you want to. Uh, so that means how much work I was actually able to complete. Uh, now about bugs, uh, here are uh, some findings that I didn't expect and they were actually very interesting for me. 30% uh, of all the bugs that were reported against installation for that release and for that testing campaign uh, came out of the tier one test suite. So they were actually discovered very early in the release cycle. Uh, for me, that means uh, tier one test suite is doing a very good job. Uh, we can probably tweak it a little bit and increase that number, uh, but maybe we, we are going to come to a threshold very soon. And that's a completely different experiment on its own. Uh, but yeah, we don't want to touch the way we do tier one. That's our first line of defense. So it's proven to be good. Uh, the other 30% of the bugs were actually found by pairwise. Uh, so what that means is uh, it's either I found some bug and I reported it as new bug, or either somebody else uh, was able to report it and I was able to reproduce. Uh, and uh, pairwise, the test case is in the pairwise plan they are a subset of the test cases of the full test plan. So this is cool. No, we do 65% less work and still find one third of uh, what we are able to achieve. So that's very good. Uh, that for me you know, looks like uh, the claim that Pairwise is, is indeed effective at finding defects is actually true. Uh, and I, I was actually expecting that not to be true. Uh, and uh, this is very surprising for me. I didn't expect this. Uh, 30% of the bugs were found by exploratory testing. And, and I went through every single one of them to read you know, what the guy did and how they found the bug. Um, and for most of the time, it's not like uh, somebody was sitting in front of the computer and trying to do anything particularly crazy. Uh, they were actually following uh, another test case with steps to reproduce, but either they did not follow the steps in exactly the same way or the uh, setup environment was a little bit different. Uh, so maybe if, if you have a test case which says uh, you need to have a RAID uh, set up on the system, uh, the test case itself doesn't say if it's going to be RAID 1, RAID 0, RAID 5, uh, what type of file system should be there, uh, these kinds of things. Um, and we, uh, we come across these edge cases. Uh, and I'm not sure if it's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, one thing. Uh, is sure, it means we have edge cases that uh, we have not described in enough details. So we hit them and we want to have more details. We, have to, we want to have more automation uh, to be sure that you know, these things don't regress in the future. Uh, 
You know, on the other hand, we, we like to give uh, test engineers uh, a lot of freedom and, you know, 10 people on the team, even, even though we have automation and we have tooling, uh, you know, th they, use, they use them in different ways and uh, we have these kind of things. Uh, stuff that I was not able to find. Uh, four critical bugs, three of which uh, are regressions. Uh, I have given the bug numbers, but unfortunately we have a policy, anything that is found uh, before the product is released to the general public is reported as private. Uh, so you are not going to, these are in bug zero, but you're, you don't have access to them, unfortunately. So you have to trust me on that. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, uh, after installation with IBFT, the default route is missing. So IBFT is like a net network attached uh, disk uh, starting directly from uh, firmware. Uh, so it's like booting on a network disk directly without having local disk on the system. If the default route is missing, uh, pretty much, you know, everything's messed up. Uh, and you don't have networking working. Uh, and that turned out to be firmware dependent, uh, which is very good for me. Uh, because, you know, that doesn't affect the results of my experiment. So firmware, hardware dependent problems, they can happen regardless of what type of testing you do. So it just happened that that particular system was faulty. Uh, and developers and everybody else were not able to reproduce on other hardware. So yay for me, cool. Uh, the next one is more uh, serious. Um, Anaconda, the installation program, uh, failed to get kickstart file from NFS on mainframe. So kickstart files are text files with configuration how to drive the installation automatically. Uh, we have functionality uh, in the installation program to bring up networking very early, uh, right after boot. Uh, and try to download these from the network if they are specified so that we can continue uh, unattended uh, from, from that point on. Uh, and this is interesting bug because it's a regression fixed by uh, a change for another bug. Uh, it's also corner case only on mainframe and it happens only on IPv6. It doesn't happen on IPv4. Uh, the reason uh, that I was not able to find uh, this type of bug with uh, pairwise testing is that the, uh, the test case, uh, test with kickstart from NFS, we have this thing in the test plan, uh, but this is one of these test cases that I consider independent and, uh, and I try to randomize. And when I looked at the results, I've always randomized this on the Intel variants, on the, the Intel architecture, and I'm nowhere expert on mainframe, so I pretty much have no idea how to work with mainframe. Uh, and my randomization tool was very stupid. It didn't look at previous executions to say, oh, you've tested this on Intel, so Let's try and, you know, test on some other platform so to make sure that, you know, we distribute evenly as possible. Uh, next one is, uh, again, networking related ISCSI. Uh, in the installation program, when you want to attach uh, a network disk, there's a small checkbox that says bind to that particular network interface if you have more of them. Uh, I tried testing this uh, very early uh, in the testing campaign. Uh, and some, I messed something up uh, with my setup environment. Uh, I decided to do this manually. Um, and I messed up and I said to myself, okay, I'm going to skip this because you know, we have uh, several mo more builds to test with. So I'm going to skip this because I don't have time. You know, I'm doing an experiment. I'm kind of like on the clock. Um, then comes the next build. Uh, and for some reason, uh, that particular test case was on the compute node variant, which is a very minimized um, Linux version uh, with uh, less software available, intended for high performance computing. Uh, and surprise, surprise, uh, the compute node variant doesn't have the iSCSI uh, client side tools available into the installation program. So the installation program just hides the screen. It doesn't al an allow you to, to access this functionality. Uh, and I did not test again. Uh, so I skipped uh, this test case several times. And all the while, there was a problem. So when I learned about the problem, I went back to the first time um, I skipped my test and tried to reproduce, and this time I was able to actually reproduce correctly. So that means I, I need to be more diligent as a person when I do my job. Uh, and the other one is uh, again a regression, uh, some errors in upgrade walk when we do upgrade. Um, we don't want to have uh, these kinds of errors because customers call us, uh, you know, if something is really horribly broken, then we should have caught this before the release. And if it's not that bad, uh, we try to silence these errors as much as possible uh, because there's pre pr pr pretty much there isn't uh, anything we can do about them. 
So first thing, I tested this, and I tested it very, very early in some of the first builds. Uh, and then uh, we have this kind of uh, policy going around. Uh, if you have a lot of work and you've tested something, uh, continue with uh, the stuff that is left idle, and only then, when you're, when you're done, uh, go back and retest uh, what you've done previously. And this is what happened in that case. I tested it early. It was working. I, I said, OK, this passes. I moved on to uh, other testing. Uh, then uh, there was a new build. There was a regression that broke. And I did not test for several releases, uh, for several builds. And you know, problem, again, <coughs> I, skipped, I skipped testing. Uh, so a few lessons that I learned from this experiment, uh, and hopefully they, will, they are something that you can apply to your job or inspire you to do something else. Uh, yeah, I have a lot of free resource now on the team. If we do 65% less uh, actual testing, then that means I can have only three or four persons on the team working on the product day, day to day, and I can have the rest six or seven people from the team uh, doing automation all the time, working on infrastructure all the time. And that's, this is huge. If I have six people doing automation all the time, it's like having a second team. This is great. Uh, the other thing that I learned for myself uh, is uh, we need to do, pass, uh, we need to do a test review uh, more regularly as a team. And I'm not talking about uh, you know, going to the bug tracker and see, oh, we have these new bugs, or we have some regressions. Let's you know, review test cases which are related to that area and improve it. I'm talking about sitting down and reading through the entire test plan and through all the test cases. Uh, as a team together, maybe you know once a month or once every three months, something like that, so that we share knowledge, we exchange ideas. Um, and by doing this, I had to do this because I needed to know what parameters are in there in these test cases so I can create my experiment. And I found we have test cases with hidden parameters, so variables that affect uh, the way we do testing, which is not explicitly described. So that's hidden knowledge within the team. I also found uh, Duplicate test cases, some purely duplicate, some which overlap uh, and test uh, pretty much similar things. So all of these are sources of optimizations which we can apply to the team. And I did not change this because I didn't want to affect my results anymore. I just, you know, if I, if I saw something which is bad, I just left it as it is and simply executed it because the rest of the team, they didn't know uh, uh, that was, ex you know, like, like that. Uh, yeah, so perform test review, hopefully, regularly, as a team. Uh, this is cool. Uh, and I've observed some patterns in the way uh, I was performing my um, experiment uh, and the way we do testing uh, inside the team, uh, which is uh, particular to our environment, uh, like, like uh, how we set up systems, how we trash these systems afterwards. Um, you know, this is also a source of other optimization. Uh, but uh, my advice for you is actually, either take a lot of notes or have somebody else to um, watch what you do and they take notes uh, and then you know uh, change somebody else does the work and you take notes and then you compare notes try to find patterns and this actually works really well you know if you have a lot of notes then you can read through all of them uh, and see what you've done and you know see things that you do repeatedly maybe they are good maybe not uh, and all of this in the context of pairwise is that uh, all of these combinations, they can be considered parameter. If I execute test cases in batches, what exactly test cases are in the batch? And just, you know, you can do pairwise again and again and again. And that's, I've never done this. It's just an idea. It's probably going to work. I don't know. Uh, uh, there, is, uh, there is risk uh, with this testing strategy because we do not do all the tests all the time for every single build. We, we are not going to execute them anymore uh, but as a team I've presented this to my team you know we have ongoing talks uh, about this and we think it's a viable strategy for us uh, to you know to do testing on the whole product uh, we think we can minimize the the risk we can mitigate it uh, somehow uh, the most important thing is uh, the human factor especially when uh, you skip testing everybody needs to know what's happening uh, uh, underneath um, so that's the most important thing for me. Uh, and that said, uh, 
I'm done talking and now it's uh, time for you to ask me questions. Okay, first question there. Uh, yeah, you go ahead. The question is, uh, based on math that you provided about percent and four bucks or less, I can conclude that 10% is four bucks, right? No. So you had 40 bucks. Okay, can you, can you tell uh, how much uh, bucks you did? Buy? No, I cannot tell you that. So, so the question was, uh, can, can I tell you how many bucks we had in the release? I cannot tell you this. Uh, you can look at the, um, the errata records that Red Hat provides on uh, their website when uh, we update. And most of the bugs are listed there publicly, but not all of them. Uh, yep, go ahead. Yeah, okay, so the question is if I have examples from history that uh, about bugs which cannot be found by pairwise with three or more four parameters, uh, pretty much like your question. Or no. He an, I think he gave an example. Wasn't your example one four zero zero eight four four? Uh, uh, tell me the title. <laughs> <laughs> one four. <laughs> but, no, but I think is, which, which one? Top one. On the, on uh, the first one. Isn't that one an exam exact example of the question uh, you're asking? No, that was different one because that mm. parameter was not a part of pairwise. It was... Uh, yeah, that's... Uh, th that it says that it was missed. Uh, no, we, it was <laughs> missed before by pairwise. Yeah, may, maybe you can answer <laughs> that for me, but... Yeah, it's... Uh, uh, this is not an example of, of what he is asking about. Uh, and, uh, you know, I... I do have access to historical data. We keep track of uh, everything that we've done in the last 15 years with respect to installation testing. Uh, you know, but it's not very easy to query. You have to go through and read everything manually. Um, yeah, I don't have an uh, answer for you right now. You know, we've never looked at this data before. But just ba based on general feeling that, you know, just from experience working with the same products for so much time, you know, I believe, uh, you know, the, the things that we are not going to, to find, the things that we are going to miss are not that many. Uh, okay, go ahead. There are certainly some parameters which are obviously dependent on each other, like the choice of host and the choice of partition as well. But if you can identify a set of parameters which are independent from each other, for example, how you bring up the network and partition, like is there some proof that by having independent parameters for, uh, Okay, so the question is, uh, is there any proof that if we have independent uh, test parameters and do pairwise, uh, that's going to reduce test coverage? Uh, uh, not going to reduce, sorry. Uh, well, I, I, I don't know if there's uh, some research done on that topic. Maybe in all these uh, white papers that I mentioned uh, on the Microsoft website. You know, you have to read all of them. I admit I, I'm more like a practical guy. I never went to read all of them. You know, just look at the uh, technique. And actually, I was told about this technique by a former Microsoft engineer uh, at another conference. But, yeah, I don't think it's going to reduce coverage uh, because still you have, you have a, a lot of mixture of test case executions. And, you know, that adds up to... Also, with respect to coverage with... Uh, Previously, uh, in different experiments, we've compared uh, data from uh, doing manual and automated testing on different platforms. And coverage uh, for the installation program in terms of uh, percent of code covered is pretty much the same all the time. Yeah, even, even if you do a default install without, without touching anything, you know, it pretty much touches everything uh, in the source code. Uh, so. Yeah, we have something like 80% coverage, which, you know, it's, it's really meaningful, not really meaningful metric, but, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, you go, you go first. This one? Uh, this one. Yeah, so these are, so pretty much all, all yeah, sorry, uh, the question is if uh, that bug, the first one, uh, is not covered by pairwise because it doesn't have parameters? Or yeah, because it's... Yeah, well... Are you thinking now of changing parameters? 
Well, that test case as defined, it doesn't have any parameters. So we, we, we want to make sure that this thing called binding to network interface actually works because when you, when you select this option, uh, this creates configuration files which need to be correct and need to be present uh, on the file system after reboot. Uh, and pretty much all of the bugs that I was not able to find out of the group which don't have parameters explicitly listed. Uh, and that was my problem. You know, be because they were s randomized in such a way or I didn't test them very well enough, um, you know, so I missed them. Uh, yes, go ahead, please. Uh, if I have, the question is if I have experience with triple-wise testing. No, I don't have. I, I've heard about this, uh, but I don't have experience. But, so yes, the, the theoretic, the literature does does describe testing in triples or, or even larger, but the, the research hints that Paris is, are enough. Yeah, the, that, that, was, that was the rationale. And the, the Microsoft research papers on it are fascinating. Yeah, so the, uh, the classical example on, I'm not sure, one of the uh, Microsoft articles that I've read about is if you open Word, uh, this is uh, where they came up with the idea first, um, in one of the settings dialogs, it has like five or six checkboxes, and you can check any one of them in any combination, so that's a lot of combinations. And, and there's like thousands of uh, checkboxes in Word for settings and stuff like that. And if you want to test everything, that's just huge. So they decided, okay, look, looked at something. There isn't a lot of information how they came to the conclusion of that two is enough. They just say, okay, two is enough. Uh, I said, let's do this. Uh, and it's proven in practice that it works. Uh, uh, how much time we've got? Oh, 10 minutes left, okay. Do you have any tool or you are using a script? Uh, okay, the question was if I have any tool or if I was using a script. So I mentioned there are many tools for different languages. In my particular case, I did not use the official Microsoft tool because that one is uh, you need to compile it. And I'm a Python person, don't like to compile stuff. Uh, and you feed it a, a text file with the parameters and it just uh, outputs uh, you know, the, the matrix uh, of the combinations. I use the Ruby pairwise gem. Uh, which can be used uh, also in Ruby scripts, uh, and it also integrates well with the Ruby testing uh, tooling. Uh, and I use that uh, to, you know, I fed it uh, with lists of uh, my test cases, parameters for every one of them, just describe this uh, uh, in declarative order. Just said, I have this and this and this, now let do Ruby do the work and output uh, the, the list of cases and the list of parameters I need to be executing for every single build. Uh, and actually, I've, I've noticed the Ruby tool uh, doesn't apply the pairwise algorithm uh, very correctly sometimes. Uh, it produces duplicate entries, uh, you know, but, but that isn't, uh, you know, that big of a problem. It's probably like one or two percent of the times. Uh, sorry, Dad, there is a main tool for uh, just to simply to try them out. Uh, okay, so he, he says there are online tools to help you uh, with this. But uh, yeah, th there are tools for every... Uh, popular programming language out there. Uh, uh, okay, a question in the back. So, um, was there an effect on how you, you met your main metrics were did you find them, but was there also an effect on how quickly you found them? Uh, so the question is what uh, about how quickly I find them. Can you repeat? I can kind of don't understand what you mean. Sorry. Okay, so the question is if uh, if there were bugs or you know that were not found the first time maybe, but then uh, we we I tested with different combination of parameters in test cases and found them on the second time. Uh, well, I don't have that information because if if I found something, let's say in uh, in build number two, then I have then I have to go back to build number one and try to to reproduce that thing, and you know. I don't know if it's been introduced in build 2 or if it was there before that. Uh, it is possible to do, but that's a lot more work to, you know, to get the data and to validate the statement. Uh, did I answer or, or no? Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, did you find by that you by testing less often, like you also miss more race conditions? Like sometimes there's a bug which happens, like depends on timing and stuff, and like it makes things uh, like it seems like it's more easy to miss people. Did you have that experience? Uh, okay, so the question is about uh, race conditions, uh, bugs that depend on timing, and if I had experience with this in the context of pairwise. Uh, first of all, during installation, we don't have these kinds of problems uh, pretty much uh, none of the time. Uh, at one point in time, the installation, I think, was multi-threaded, but currently, it's, I, I think it's mostly single-threaded uh, because it was very hard to debug these things in the installation environment. Um, you know, you have to burn ISO media, reboot systems, and stuff like that. It takes a lot of time simply to get to a point where you can debug something and figure out what's going on. And it may not be reproducible. Uh, that said, uh, you know, if you do desktop testing or, you know, something, something else uh, which can be easily tested and reproduced, uh, then I guess, uh, you know, you, you can have uh, problems with uh, race conditions. But again, you know, the uh, um, uh, race conditions, they happen kind of randomly. Uh, so you, you, have, you don't have any idea whether or not pairwise affected the, uh, you know, the happening of the race condition. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it's affected by the sheer, uh, like, because it's just random, that's often. So you have a, a, a well, chance. Well, I can, well, I, I tend to disagree with that because, you know, if I run the, my tests, all the time, but I run them on the same system with the same load and, you know, kind of in a predictable environment, uh, the race condition may never happen. Uh. So, had you evaluated associating code changes to your test selection and having that be some governor for the, the pair selection? Uh, we do this kind of, so the question is, have I evaluated uh, associated code changes to uh, govern uh, the uh, parameter uh, selection in testing. Uh, we do this uh, when we uh, design test cases, uh, uh, like for new functionality, for example, we have bugs and we try to evaluate this uh, and need to create new test cases. We do that kind of analysis, uh, but that's not subject to the experiment. I just took whatever was existing uh, at that point in time and I knew the team was going to use the same set of test cases which have been already created before the, the release uh, so I just used that. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, yes, if now, now that we know how pairwise works, uh, we can be thinking more in terms of parameters to testing. Because honestly, until now, uh, we haven't taught a lot in terms of parameters. So if the parameters were obvious, yes, we put them into testing. And if they weren't that obvious, you have to, you know, kind of go to the source code, see what's happening, or have some customer tell you that, yes, this is a particular problem in one particular environment, so we can, you know, add parameters to that. Um, and also, you have to realize the existing test suite, that's a product of many, many years of, uh, you know, development of the installation and uh, uh, upgrade of the test suite. You know, it's not something we came up uh, just before the release. So it's based on a lot of historical data. Okay, if you don't have more questions, uh, thank you for uh, being here.